In this lesson, we're moving past our discussion of witnesses and testimonial evidence into our discussion of tangible evidence or evidence that the jury can hold in their hands, right? And anytime we're thinking about tangible evidence, we have to start with authentication under rules 901 through 902 of the federal rules of evidence. So anytime though that I talk about authentication, I like to start with a very simple example to kind of illustrate how this all plays out. So imagine that you own a pawn shop or any type of antique store that deals in collectibles. And let's say one day you're at your shop and a guy comes in holding a guitar and he approaches you and he tells you that he has a guitar that was played by Jimmy Hendrix and he wants to sell it to you for a quarter of a million dollars based on the fact that Jimi Hendrix played this guitar. It makes it extremely valuable, right? It's a very rare guitar. He tells you it's worth a quarter of a million dollars. That's what he's willing to sell it to you for. So what are you going to do before you immediately pull out your checkbook or your credit card and start to write this guy a check for a quarter of a million dollars? What are you going to want to do with that guitar? Obviously, right? You want to authenticate it. You want to verify that this guitar is what this guy who came into your shop claims it to be, that it was indeed played by Jimi Hendrix. Before you shell out a quarter of a million dollars, you are going to want to authenticate that guitar to make sure that it is what this guy who came into your shop claims it to be. So how might you do that? Well, a great way would be if somebody who knew Jimi Hendrix came in, somebody with personal knowledge, a friend of Jimi Hendrix, a bandmate, a manager, someone who really knew Jimi Hendrix well could come in and say, hey, look, yeah, I was there. That is definitely the guitar. I saw Jimi Hendrix playing that guitar. I have firsthand personal knowledge, I witnessed it, right? We have an eyewitness. Well, that would be great, right? That would be one way. That would be very strong evidence that this guitar is what this guy claims it to be. It is indeed a Jimi Hendrix guitar, right? How else could we authenticate it? Well, maybe we have a distinctive characteristic on the guitar, right? There's some scratch in a specific location or mark on the guitar that Jimi Hendrix wrote in a memoir was on this guitar, right? Jimi Hendrix said somewhere that this particular guitar had a scratch on the backside, on the, you know, whatever, right? And there's a very particular mark. And this guitar has that same mark that Jimi Hendrix described, right? We have a distinctive characteristic. Well, that could be strong evidence that this guitar is what the guy who came to the shop claims it to be, right? Or we could even have an expert come in, some sort of guitar expert that could look at it. He knows Jimi Hendrix guitars. He could analyze it and really help us figure out the authenticity of the guitar, whether or not it is what this guy who came into the shop claims it to be, whether or not it's a Jimi Hendrix guitar, right? All of these would be ways that we could go about authenticating whether or not this guitar is what the guy who came to the shop claims it to be, whether or not it's a Jimi Hendrix guitar. Right? And so what we have here is the same rules apply in a court of law. Right? Anytime a person comes into court and wants to present tangible evidence, right? we want to authenticate that tangible evidence. We want to make sure that that evidence is what the proponent claims it to be. Right? And so how do we determine this? Well, we have rules 901 through 902 of the federal rules of evidence, right? And this is what all of this is on the board, different ways to authenticate and a piece of evidence. But the idea here is, right, we want to anytime somebody comes into court with some sort of physical evidence or some tangible evidence, whether that's a photograph, a videotape, telephone conversations, a physical object, some sort of documentary evidence, they come in with a will, a trust, a deed, or some sort of contract, a letter, a fax, whatever it is, right? They come in holding something, some sort of tangible evidence. Well, we always want to make sure that this evidence is what the proponent of this evidence claims it to be, right? Before we admit it and let the jury consider this, right? We need to make sure it is what this guy, remember in our guitar example, we want to make sure before we shell out a quarter of a million dollars, we want to make sure that this guitar is what this guy claims it to be. 
Same thing applies in a courtroom, right? Before we're going to introduce evidence, we want to make sure it is what the proponent claims it to be. And that's what this whole process of authentication is. Now, important to recognize at the top, right? Authentication is a low standard of proof, right? To prove that something is what you claim it to be, it's even lower than a preponderance of the evidence standard, right? So long as it could support a jury finding, right? Which is lower than a preponderance of the evidence, that's going to be sufficient. And sometimes authentication can just be one sentence, right? We have a witness who says, yeah, that is it, right? Boom, we've authenticated it, right? It can be that simple. It can be one line of testimony from an eyewitness who can say, yeah, that's the contract. I was there. That is the contract, right? So sometimes authentication can be very easy. It can be one line, right? It's not necessarily like our guitar example where you might want to, before you shell out a quarter of a million dollars, right? your burden of proof as the shop owner might be extremely high. In a courtroom, it's actually a pretty low standard of proof, right? As long as there's enough proof to support a jury finding that's going to be sufficient for authentication under rules 901 through 902 of the federal rules rules of evidence. So just want to make sure we're all clear on that. The burden here, you don't have to prove something is what the proponent claims it to be with certainty or even with any reasonable certainty or even by a preponderance of the evidence. It just has to support a jury finding, which is usually a pretty low threshold. It's an easy standard to meet most of the time. But Let's get into it. Let's get into rule 901 and talk about how would we go about authenticating different pieces of tangible evidence. So I think the best way to think about authentication is actually to think about it as categories of different types of tangible evidence. We could go line by line through 901, but I found it's actually better rather than just looking at the statute to try to just categorize different pieces of tangible evidence and show how we apply 901 to these different pieces of evidence, okay? So we can start with photographs and videotapes, right? This is very common, especially in trials and modern time, right? We're almost always going to have photographs and videotapes being introduced. Anytime we have a photograph or videotape coming in, what are we going to want to do, right? Well, number one, we know our first gateway issue always, as we discussed in the very beginning of this evidence course, is going to be relevant. So you'd always still apply, even with tangible evidence, you still start with your relevance analysis. You do 401, is the evidence probative and material? And then from there, right, once you've gone through your 401 analysis with tangible evidence, you're gonna to jump to 901 and authenticate the evidence. Can we authenticate this evidence? Is this evidence what the proponent of the evidence claims it to be? Is this the Jimi Hendrix guitar or not, right? And so for photographs and videotapes, how do we authenticate evidence under 901? Well. Here, we say that we do need a witness with first-hand knowledge. Remember, we talked about this rule 602 first-hand knowledge requirement, right? So we need a witness with first-hand knowledge to establish that the photo is an accurate and faithful representation of the scene or object depicted. So if we have a videotape or a photograph, we need somebody who was at the scene being depicted to say that, yes, this is accurate. I was there, this is what it looked like, right? If we have that, then we have authentication of a photograph or a videotape, very easy, right? Now, the problem here with photographs and videotapes can be when we have a situation where no witness was actually at the scene to come forward and testify, right? We don't have a witness with first-hand knowledge. Think about a surveillance tape or an ATM camera that takes photos of patrons using an ATM. We might not have a witness at the scene who can come with first-hand knowledge and tell us that this, is a, this photo or this video is an accurate and faithful representation of the scene or object depicted, right? Because it's a surveillance tape. No one was there, right? So that's why we call this the silent witness theory. And in law school, you probably read several cases on this, but the answer is easy, right? This is codified under rule 901B9, which is going to basically say that if 
we can show that the process or system used to produce the video or photograph is accurate that will authenticate it. So if we have a surveillance tape or even an x-ray, right? X-rays is another common example of this, right? No witness can testify to the scene depicted in an x-ray, right? Human eyes can't perceive what an x-ray image is, right? So we can't have a witness testify that an x-ray with first-hand knowledge that an x-ray, right, is accurately depicting the scene or object of the image, right? Because the human eye physically cannot see that. So what do you do, right? Silent witness here. This would apply to surveillance tapes or ATM photographs where we don't have a witness with first-hand knowledge. You just have to show that the process or system used to produce the image or video is accurate. And again, this is rule 901B9, right? So here with an x-ray, you would just need a technician or whoever to come in and say, yeah, look, the process and system we used to take this x-ray was accurate and reliable. Boom, right? Now we've authenticated the x-ray, okay? And that's the silent witness theory. So photographs, if we have a witness with firsthand knowledge, you can come and say, this is the scene, I was there. What's being depicted in this photo is an accurate representation of the scene. That's great. If it's a situation like an x-ray or surveillance tape and we don't have a witness with first-hand knowledge, that's fine. Silent witness theory, we go to rule 901B9, which is going to say if we can show that the process or system used to produce the image, photo, or video was accurate, that's fine. So that's how we handle photographs and videotapes, okay? Next, we have oral statements, right? And usually these are sound recordings of oral statements in one way or another. Thank you so much for watching this video preview of our Legal Education Accelerator Program, or LEAP for short. If you would like to see the conclusion of this video and gain full access to our entire 1L and 2L video library, integrated outlines, streamable audio versions, additional practice exams with explanations, and much more, we invite you to head over to our website and join the thousands of law students who have already enrolled. To get started with your no-risk free trial today, simply click the link in the description box below or visit www.studicata.com forward slash leap. Hi everyone, my name is Serena and I'm currently a law student at South Texas College of Law, Houston. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Shiva and I'm currently a law student at Southwestern. Hi everyone, my name is Michelle um, and I am a first year student at South Texas College of Law, Houston. Um, I used the Studicata study video series last semester to help me prepare mostly for contracts um, and I actually made an A plus in contracts last semester which I greatly dedicate to the Studicata video. By using Studicata to help me prepare for my final exam, I was able to score the highest grade out of my class on the final and even have my uh, essay distributed as the model answer. Not to mention I had done quite poorly on the midterm and was struggling throughout the whole course of the semester, understanding the material and keeping up with lectures. Because of the Studicata video lectures, I was able to go into my exams with a feeling of confidence. I didn't have to worry about what the rules of law were or how I was going to organize my answer to an essay question. I would absolutely recommend the Studicata series and their online course materials to anyone. Um, I think that they are not like um, professor lectures that you might find online or other outside study materials that you may encounter. Um, I think that the Studicata videos really focus on not only ensuring that you understand the material that you're going to encounter on your final, um, but they also help you to understand kind of the best method for test taking and they really break down how to approach each problem and the best ways to tackle certain methods on testing um, and I think that's really important and I think it's really special. I don't see that anywhere else um, in any of the other online resources that I've found. So I would certainly recommend Sudakata to anyone who is studying in law school right now. Um, good luck on your studying and you're going to do great. I would definitely uh, recommend Studicata to anybody watching this video. Uh, give it a chance. I'm sure, I'm positive that you will love it, uh, that you will get a lot out of it. 
uh, and that you will be happy that you gave it a chance. Uh, I definitely am. I know I will be using uh, Studicata in the future. And I cannot thank Studicata enough for getting me through my first semester of law school. I will definitely, definitely continue to watch the Studicata video lectures throughout my law school career. And I highly recommend that any future or current law student do the same.